to introduce you to all of our presenters. Um, we're going to talk about career readiness competencies, self-assessment, writing a resume, creating a LinkedIn profile, developing a personal pinch, pitch, excuse me, networking using breakout rooms, interviewing skills. We're going to close it up before you break out into your specific micro-credential section with your faculty member. So let's go on to the next slide. So our presenters today, we have Kara Becker, Marietta Botero, myself, Tina Coco, I'm the pre-law advisor at Baruch Star Career Development Center, Cheryl Probst, Jennifer Rogers, Marion Vire, and Hope Winters. And we're all staff members at Baruch Star Career Development Center. So let's talk about the in initiative goals of the 27 CEOs. It's to hire early career New Yorkers for stable jobs leading to long-term careers. The aim is to hire 100,000 New Yorkers by the year 2030, including 25,000 CUNY students. And our goal today is to help you learn how micro-credentials will prepare you for these job and internship opportunities. But we wanna stress that although we'll be going over some really important tips during today's workshop, we encourage you to follow up with your school's career counselor. Next slide. All right, and now we have a special message from CUNY's Chancellor. Hi, I am Felix Matos Rodriguez, the Chancellor of the City University of New York, and I want to congratulate each one of you for taking advantage of this new CUNY opportunity to boost your skills for in-demand jobs. Not only are you helping yourself, but you're also making history, participating in the very first set of courses developed jointly by the partnership of the New York Job CEO Council and CUNY. We are so proud of you. CUNY is partnering with 27 of the largest companies in New York City through the New York Job CEO Council to strengthen career pathways and give you a competitive advantage with council companies in their hiring for paid internships and full-time jobs. We are committed to preparing you for the jobs of the future that have family sustaining wages and opportunities for real career advancement. We know you got this. You are the talented CUNY students that are the future of New York City's workforce. I wish you the best of luck. Congratulations. Great, Thank you to our chancellor for that great message. So just to go over the four micro-credential cer certifications offered and talked about today, there'll be project management, data analytics, cybersecurity, and software engineering. If you haven't already renamed yourself, please do that now with the micro-credential that you're, you're part of and followed by your full name. All right, some online workshop edit etiquette reminders. So in order for our workshop to run smoothly, we ask that you keep yourself on mute. Turning on your video is welcome, but not required. If you utilize your video, please make sure that you're dressed properly and your background is free of distraction. Questions during the workshop are welcome. Please feel free you to use the chat box for questions. We'll check it periodically. And you may also use the raise hand feature if and when a facilitator poses a question to the group. So we'll start off with my colleague Cheryl on career readiness. Cheryl, take it away. Thank you so much, Tina. So I'm Cheryl Probst, and I'm also a career counselor at the Star Career Development Center at Baruch. So um, I'm going to talk uh, about what it means to be career ready. And to do that, I'm going to introduce the NACE career competencies. So NACE is the National Association of College Employers, and they analyze specifically what skills employers are looking for in college candidates. Uh, but before I introduce the skills, um, let's uh, get everyone thinking about skills. So let's do a poll. Okay, so the first question, uh, employers value, uh, true or false, employers value critical thinking and problem solving skills as the most essential career readiness competency among their new hires, even above leadership skills and digital technology skills. Uh, 
Okay, so just uh, we'll just take a couple of seconds um, to uh, get your results. Uh, so if you could just click true or false. Um, okay, we looks like we have eighty three percent voted, eighty six percent, eighty eight percent. Okay, can we get to ninety? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so can we share the results? Okay. So um, so most of you think that that's true, and that is true. Uh, so problem solving and critical thinking refers to the ability for you to use knowledge, facts, and data to effectively solve problems. And to do that, you may demonstrate originality and inventiveness. And this is what employers find most essential in their new hires, even more important than leadership skills and tech skills. Um, okay, so let's um, move on to the next uh, polling question. Uh, so can we launch uh, poll number two? Um, and true or false, students rated themselves higher on career readiness than employers. Uh, true or false? Uh, okay, so we have 10% voted, uh, 40, 50% voted, uh, 70, let's see if we can make it to over 90. Uh, we're at 84, 87. Uh, 89, okay, great, shall we share the results? Okay, so it looks like uh, most of you, 65% say true, a few of you said false, so this is true also. So take notes, students think they are career ready, but employers beg to differ. Developing these readiness skills can really set you apart from the competition in the job search process. Okay, so now on to these eight skills. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first and most value skill that we already mentioned uh, is the critical thinking and problem solving. Um, and so the critical thinking and problem solving, again, is the ability to use knowledge, facts, and data to effectively solve problems. And it may involve demonstrating originality and inventiveness. So how do you develop critical thinking and problem solving skills? So for example, if you're in college, uh, you're taking a college course, you're doing a research project, or maybe even you're confronted with a problem during this um, micro-credential program uh, that may involve surveys, data analysis, and perhaps originality and inventiveness. And this is how you would develop these skills. And so how can you articulate this, uh, that you have these skills or that you're developing these skills to an employer? So, um, you know, you can uh, use this experience to answer the question, tell me about a time when you had to examine a problem in depth and how did you go about it? Um, okay, so the second um, career competency we're gonna talk about is oral and written communication skills, very important skills. So em employers want you to be able to articulate thoughts and ideas effectively. And so you develop these, uh, where's the opportunity? So, you know, by giving presentations during school projects, maybe giving PowerPoint presentations, uh, maybe you're writing articles for the school newspaper. And so how can you tell an employer that you have these skills or that you're developing these skills? So in the job search process, uh, you have a lot of opportunity. Like for example, if you present a well-written well-written cover letter, uh, well-written thank you notes, uh, you can show off your oral communication skills um, by interviewing. Um, you can reference articles you've written for a journal or a school paper, and you can describe this experience on your resume. Uh, okay, so the third competency, teamwork and collaboration skills. And so employers want you to be able to build relationships and resolve conflicts. Uh, so how do you develop these? Uh, where's the opportunity? So uh, you, you know, these skills involve interacting with others, maybe in club environments, so joining clubs, activities, uh, volunteering, um, working on a team or a group project, even during a class project. Um, that's how you would develop these skills. And so how can you articulate that you have these skills? So in the interview process, you can talk about how you brought people together, how you solved conflicts. Um, you know, you may even get a job interview through networking skills, which would show really strong collaboration skills as well. So later on in this presentation, my colleagues Hope and Marietta are going to be talking more about networking. Um, and so the fourth competency, digital technology. So employers are looking for you to be competent and efficient with existing and new technology. So how do you develop these skills? And so um, this micro-credential program is a great way of developing digital technology. Um, also through coursework, online courses, um, internships uh, would also help you do that. And so how do you go about articulating these to an employer that you have these skills? And so on your resume, 
you can actually put a skills section um, with all of your digital technology to highlight all of these skills. And my colleague Marion is going to show you how to do this uh, later on in the presentation in the resume section. And so um, the next leadership or the next um, career competency is leadership. So uh, another very important skill, employers want you to have the ability to motivate, coach and develop others. And so how do you develop these? Uh, so these can be done through training a colleague, uh, planning an event, uh, running for a club position. And so how do you go about articulating to an employer that you have these skills? And so there could be a whole separate section on your resume entitled leadership activities. Um, you can share your stories and experiences during an interview. Uh, maybe even a leadership position led you to an interview. And so my colleague Jen is gonna talk uh, more about interviewing techniques uh, further on in the presentation. Uh, so professionalism and work ethic um, competency, another very important competency. So employers are looking for candidates who have good work habits like showing up on time, dressing appropriately, being productive, being polite, asking good questions and acting responsibly. So how do you develop these? Um, so these you can practice during internships um, in any kind of professional work or school settings um, where you can conduct yourself professionally, even on Zoom calls like this, for example. And so how do you articulate these to an employer? So these things you would, um, you would probably not tell an employer, but you would probably show them. Um, and then, you know, when they meet you, they can see uh, you have a strong handshake, a good eye to eye contact. Hopefully we'll be doing that, um, you know, within the next year or so. Um, but even on Zoom calls, uh, certainly on online meetings, uh, you can come across as very confident and professional. Um, and so career management is, an, is the seventh competency. And so employers want you to be able to identify opportunities that are best for you. Um, can you formulate goals and develop strategies that meet those goals? And so how do you develop these skills? So college is a great place to develop these skills. There's uh, career sessions like this that are great opportunities. Um, certainly meeting with your career advisor to talk through your career plans, um, have them review your resumes and your other uh, career type documents. Um, you can obtain a mentor, an experienced professional who can teach you about a particular field you want to work in. Um, you can meet with industry professionals uh, for uh, informational interviews. Uh, Kara, another colleague, is going to talk about um, how to connect via LinkedIn um, to some uh, to, uh, alumni at your various schools so that you will be able to set up informational interviews with them. And, uh, and so how do you articulate these skills to an employer? So you can show employers that you've done your research and you know that a particular position would be right for you. Uh, and so the final competency is global and intercultural fluency skills. So employers want you to interact respectfully with people from diverse backgrounds. And so how do you develop these skills? So you can take advantage of things like uh, study abroad programs, uh, you can travel internationally, you can join a cultural or religious club, uh, learning a new, a new language. Um, and so how do you articulate these skills? So you can have a separate section on your resume uh, for language skills. You can have a separate section for the clubs that you've joined. And a lot of your travel experiences can be talked about uh, during an interview. Okay, so now uh, it's poll time again. So, uh, okay, so the question is, with which career competency do you feel most comfortable right now? Okay, looks like we have about 10%, 20%. Okay, 70%, 80, 84. Okay, do we wanna uh, share the poll? Okay, so it looks like, um, so great. So gl I'm glad to see most people feel comfortable with critical thinking, problem solving. That's awesome. That's a really important skill and professionalism, work ethic. Um, okay, great. So here's another poll. Um, which career competency do you feel least comfortable with right now? Okay, we have 30, 40%. 80% were at 87, 89. Okay, are we ready to share the poll? Okay, least competent looks like um, 
global and international fluency and leadership. So remember, developing these skills is an ongoing process. And right now, some of you may just be at the beginning of the learning curve, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, so being aware of what it takes to be career ready is a great first step to your training. Okay, so here are just a few takeaways. Um, students rated themselves higher on career readiness than employers. And so developing these skills can really set you apart from the competition. Um, so know these eight competencies and spend college years developing them via clubs and on-campus organizations, jobs and internships, project and coursework. Um, and, all, and of course, by attending career workshops like this one and taking advantage of opportunities like these micro-credentialing programs and other profes professional skills workshops that um, you might have an opportunity to sign up for. Uh, so based on our own internal research at the Star Career Development Center at Baruch, we have found that students who spend time developing these competencies are much more likely to have a job at graduation than those who do not. So the bottom line is uh, we recommend utilizing the services at your school's career center. They are there for you and can help you best communicate these skills to potential employers. Okay, and then the final slide, I just wanted to let you know that uh, this handout will be included in a follow-up email. So I recommend uh, downloading it, printing it out, maybe hanging it up in your room and you know, checking in with this list every so often to inspire you and to um, seek opportunities to develop these skills. And so now I'd like to introduce uh, Marietta Botero who will be talking to you about self-assessment and the SWOT analysis. Marietta. Thank you, Cheryl. Great job. We have a lot to unpack in this uh, couple of 90 minutes that we have. So. Um, the SWOT analysis identifies um, the, uh, your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to uh, your career development or to identify an internship or a full-time job. Um, we will say, you will be able to uh, get a copy of this SWOT analysis that you see on the screen. So uh, be, stay tuned because you will receive it. But a SWOT analysis is a technique used to assess your strengths your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and um, often are addressed in interviews as well. So you should be prepared to think about these things. I suggest you do some brainstorming and honest self-reflection to see where you stand with these uh, strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities. Um, opportunities and threats relate to you in the job market and brainstorming with yourself and perhaps a trusted advisor or a professor will really help you to circle around where, you, um, where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and keep them identified in the right category. Strengths are really, how do you deal with change? And that's a big question that you can be asked in, in an interview. Um, what skills do you have is something they wanna know. What skills are required for the role? So if you're doing a self-assessment, you really want to look at the job description or the um, uh, information that you have as to what those particular roles in your career goal are all about and what you're required or need, and need to have as a skill set in your toolbox. Um, so brainstorm. Be honest with yourself. Self-reflection is really important. If you track your opportunities and the ch and the changes that um, come about in, in time that demand on the impact of global events that affect your job or where you think you belong in the marketplace, um, make sure that uh, under your strengths, when you're doing that self-analysis, you look and, and ask yourself, am I em empathetic? Am I dedicated to what I believe I wanna do? Am I determined to be successful? Am I action oriented? Um, how disciplined am I? Am I focused on getting results? Am I innovative? Am I patient? What, so what are the great skills that I have and what are my strengths? Um, your weaknesses, unfortunately I have found over the last couple of years that these two things seem to be a weakness in college students, time management and organizational skills. So those are two things. If you possess them and they're in your strengths category, fantastic. But if not, it's something you need to decide to work on. And I always suggest that um, you think about these um, weaknesses that you need to work on and time box yourself 
And by that, I mean that you say, okay, within three months, I am going to overcome this weakness and put it into my strengths column. So it's something you need to work on. And when you're on an interview and someone says, well, what have you been working on about yourself? You, it's something you can talk about. Um, so those are come, some of the things also, you know, make sure that you have proper networking protocols and those will come about in later portion of this uh, presentation. Opportunities um, can be um, increased reliance on technology. And some of the categories that we're dealing with with this, with this particular group are technology related. Um, so if you're a savvy student in technology, you can really stick out when you're at an interview and get a job. If you're graduating in 2023, 2024, you can say that by that time, the economy and the job market would have recovered from the current COVID crisis. Um, so that's a very good uh, opportunity for you to have in your category coming going forward as, as an opportunity in the future. Um, more demand on skilled labor, on people who have technology skills in particular, um, become very competent and highly desirable. So make sure that you are really a competent graduate and that you ooze that competency. Um, the threats would be obviously today, if you were writing this, the threats would be COVID has an effect on recruiting cycles, um, internships as well. Um, the economic sh uh, slowdown uh, probably will lead to less hiring. We don't know. Um, Disruptive technologies can affect jobs done by humans. So that's something else to think about in your tech world. And we're in a very hyper competitive environment. And that means that only the best end up obtaining some of those plum jobs. So those are things to think about when you're thinking about yourself and where you see yourself going and how you're going to assess what skills you need to acquire. There are great places that you can go to. There's Coursera, which is free. Um, Khan Academy is another one. So when you look at yourself and say critical thinking or whatever else you think that you need to work on, this is really a good place to make that list and start the work, time box yourself. So if you have any questions, put it in the chat box and we're happy to answer them. Thank you. The next topic is going to be resumes. Hi everyone, Marianne. welcome. Oh, thank you, Marietta. Uh, welcome, everyone. Again, congratulations to getting into the micro-credential program. Today, we're going to talk about how important it is to have a well-crafted resume. Um, can we move to the next slide? And maybe in the chat, if everyone could just say, what do you think the purpose of the resume is? Just So if you had, you know, as you're creating a resume, what is this resume for? If everyone could just put their thoughts in the chat, that'd be great to get your foot in the door or a job, experience and skills, to showcase your skills. Absolutely, these are some of the points in developing a resume. But what is what is it ultimately for? Is it to get a job? Is it to get past the HR person? Your resume? Great, so these are some definitely points. And when we're thinking about the purpose of the resume, I think the purpose of the resume is not to get a job per se, but just like someone just wrote is to get an interview. So that is the ultimate purpose. And how long, in the, now let's switch gears. How long do you think it would take an employer uh, to review your resume? Uh, when you're submitting it, how long do you think they would spend in, in looking at your resume? Someone said two to three minutes, someone said 30 seconds, five seconds, 60 seconds. I think five minutes, one minute, uh, I think definitely about 30 seconds or less. So when we're thinking about writing our resume, we're making sure that the resume is more scannable than readable in that sense. So um, make it that employers definitely spend 30 seconds or less um, in reviewing a resume. So it's really important that it's very written very well, it's scannable and it articulates all the points that they're looking for. Can we move to the next slide, please? The three main things that employers expect to see in a, in a resume is a combination of your academic experience, your professional experience, such as your jobs and your paraprofessional opportunities, as well as personal, which is leadership, volunteer, and activities. Those three things employers like to see play out on the resume. And so we'll talk about how to articulate those three things um, within the actual document itself. <clears throat> 
So these are some of the sections that's definitely something you can create on your resume. There's a few more, but definitely these are some that I find it's really important to have somehow get on your resume. So if you feel like you don't have one of these, it's definitely some find a way to include it in your resume. We'll break down a little bit of how it should be formatted in your resume a little bit, but these are some of the categories that I find is really important and employees really wanna see uh, those eight core competency that Cheryl talked about earlier play out on your actual document. Next slide, please. So as far as contact information, this is the first thing that employers should see. And when we're sort of figuring out the format of the resume, it's mostly your academic information towards the top, and then it transitions into your professional experiences, and then transition to personal or leadership. So contact information absolutely should be on the top. And nowadays you don't need your specific address, but employers still need to see city and state and zip for the most part. Have a phone number, uh, make sure that phone number is a, a number that you know you can answer professionally. Um, the email, we suggest that using your school email is more official. If you're not gonna use your, your school email, make sure you use a, an email that you create that's professional. That means the like first or last name would suffice. Um, having a LinkedIn profile, my colleague Kara is going to talk a little bit about the importance of that. But if you have a GitHub account or if you have your own website, even if you have a QR code, those are things that you could definitely put in your contact information section. Okay. So next category that's, again, we're focusing on academic to professional to personal is your education section. And depending on how much space you have, you always start with your most current university. So Baruch College, if you're going to Baruch College, start with Baruch College. If you transferred, you'd still go start with the school that you're currently attending. Definitely articulate the university that you're part of, the college that you're part of, location, make sure the degree is correct. Um, that's sometimes I find that students forgot sometimes the Bachelor of Arts versus the Bachelor of Science. Just be mindful of that. Employers want to know your major, your minor, and your GPA. And if your GPA is less than 3.0, make sure you don't put it on your resume. The only time you should put your GPA is if it's 3.0 and above. What I find that students tend to have their major GPA higher. So if your overall GPA is lower than 3.0, you definitely want to see if your major GPA is higher than the 3.0. And then you can articulate your major GPA versus your overall GPA. Just make sure you identify that accordingly. Coursework is another section. Employers definitely want to know what type of academic knowledge you know. And so this is important to articulate and the coursework has to be specific to the position that you're applying for. So, and if you're taking a course now, if you just started it, you can definitely put it in your resume. Just make sure you write the word present in parentheses next to the actual course. I like to separate these um, as coursework from education, depending on space, you can definitely make this as a subcategory to education, but from a technology perspective, they really like to see that highlighted in that they understand, again, your academic knowledge um, when they're reviewing your resume. Next section is projects. Projects could be anything that could be in your classes, this could also be a tech project that you're working on your own. So this does not have to be an academic project. Um, the way you, you would need to identify it to make sure if it's a personal project, instead of a name of the class, you would put in a personal project. And then the bullets are, uh, the, the bullets, the way you write your bullets is the same way you were going to write your work experience. You always start with an action word, like a verb, quantify whenever you can. The jargons are the tech skills that we're talking about. So the jargons are usually something you can find in the job posting. So when you're crafting your resume, make sure those jargons that employers are looking for in the job postings are articulated in multiple locations within your resume and then specify what it is that you did. Never assume the employer must know what you're talking about. You know, just make sure that it's important to articulate everything as clear as possible. Because like I mentioned earlier, it's more about scannability. And if it's not in your resume, to them, it doesn't exist, even if it's something so elementary. Next section, please. Experience. So experience includes everything from internships to jobs. So don't make sure that if you have everything from working at Starbucks to tutoring to working at an internship somewhere, make sure all those are important. With every experience, don't feel like employers are not going to appreciate it. Employers love to see those professional experience. As, men, as Cheryl mentioned earlier, you know, work ethics is important to employers, and they assume that or they can infer that from all your work experience. They, they see that you've worked at different places. They can infer that you have some professionalism. Your work ethics is there. It's nurtured in those different skills. The way it's formatted is, of course, the name of the company is important, the location, your job title, and month to year 
to present. So month to year is a suffice. You don't need to have specific dates. Um, definitely month and year will be enough. And the way you wrote your bullets for your project is the same way you're going to write your bullets for your work experience. Action word, quantify, have those jargons whenever possible. Um, and those jargons should be reflective of the job posting. And then definitely elaborate on what you actually did with that type, with your work experience. Leadership is another great way that employers like to see play out on the resume. So it, one ideally should be something that you're interested in after graduation. And another type of leadership could be anything not related. So it could be sports, it could be just an activity, uh, whatever you have on your campus. But leadership is important on a resume. It doesn't mean that you have to be an executive board member. Being an active member in a club or a group on or off campus is definitely appreciated by employers. So if you don't have this on your resume already, this is something that you should think about how you can include it in your resume for uh, when you start looking for an internship or a full-time job outside of the micro-credential program. Next slide. Activities are any, if you participate in any hackathons, CUNY is coming up with it. The CUNY hackathon is coming up in the third week of January. So that's definitely something you can include under activities. If you volunteer, like during the holidays, a lot of people volunteer for soup kitchens and things like that. That's definitely something to put in here. And any extracurricular activities that wasn't included in the other section, this would be the most appropriate place to put it. Next is the technical skills. This is the thing that's very different than if you are a finance student or accounting student. The technical skills or the computer skills section is gonna be a, li a little more elaborate. And employees really like to see subcategories kind of being specific so that it spells it out a little more. So if you find that the skills that you that employers are generally looking for in the profession that you're, you're looking to get into, you don't have, as Marianne mentioned earlier, a way to kind of, kind of upskill your resume is taking courses in Coursera, Linda, anywhere that you can find some online platform. Coursera is definitely free now for New York State residents. Lynda.com is free through the New York Public Library. These are all online. So if you find that you are, are not as strong in like R or Python or TypeScript, things like that, then those are things that you can definitely log into these online platform and upskill your resume. Those type of learning platforms are definitely very important way to upskill your resume. And with technology changing so rapidly, you wanna make sure you're up to date with all those technical skills because they do change very, very quickly. Next slide, please. Language, this is foreign language. This is not computer language. And the most three common verbiage are fluent, proficient, and knowledge. And fluent is read, write, and speak in that language. Proficient is sort of the middle ground and knowledge is the fundamentals. This is all based on an honor system. So you sort of decide where you fit. No one's really gonna test you on it. But if you put a language and that person happens to speak it, chances are they'll probably speak on, it, on that language. So again, this is more of an honorary system. You decide where you lie. Um, within these sort of verbiage, but it's important to have this if you do speak another language. Sometimes students don't appreciate that having a, another language is a, a great way to diversify your resume. So definitely it's important, even if you think that no one would appreciate that language, it's really still worth putting in your resume. Certification, so this is what we're doing here, the micro-credential. It's best to definitely separate it rather than a subcategory. And this could be certifications that you get through this program, the micro-credential program, through LinkedIn Le Learning, Linda or Coursera. All of those are absolutely le legit and employers love to see them on a resume. So again, employers aren't expecting you to be experts in everything yet. You're a student, you're still learning, you're developing your talent and your skills, but these certifications are gonna sort of make sure it gives them a, a good comfortability that you understand some fundamentals within those different technology skills. So make sure that if you don't have it, don't expect the classroom to provide everything. And even if they're teaching the classroom, it's good to complement it with these online platforms. Since definitely Linda and Coursera are free now, um, it's definitely a great way to upskill your resume. So I do encourage everyone to take time to, to figure out a way how to upskill your resume through these online platforms. Great, so the general format, one to two pages. If your second page is full of relevant content, it's absolutely okay to go to two pages. It's more or less if it's like, if you worked at five different Starbucks, you don't probably need to list five different um, Starbucks. So if that goes onto two pages because of that, that's an easy way to make it into one page. Margins are generally about one to a half an inch. Uh, font types should be Arial, Calibri, and Times. There's really no need to be fancy with your font types. 
but definitely with uh, like block type, script type fonts, it's really hard to read. But also applicant tracking systems have a very difficult time picking up those type of font types. So, and really employers are not gonna drast make a big difference if you use times versus Arial. So sometimes people think it's to be fancy that way. It really isn't gonna help your resume elevate it to use a different font type, unless it's a font type that's really not hard to read. Contact and heading should be 12 to 14, just to make it fit in one page. Content 10 to 12, just for readability. So these are things that are basic fundamentals um, that I think you should sort of go by, and but definitely nothing more than two pages for sure. So this is a general, well, you know, a general overview about a, the, the resume that we've been talking about. There are different ways to format a resume. Definitely one is not better than the other, but just making sure that it's clear, concise, and informative. Meaning that if one, if you're gonna hyphenate something, make sure it's hyphenated throughout the, the, the resume. If you're gonna shorten something, make sure it's shortened throughout the resume. So that it just looks aesthetically uh, appropriate, it's professional, and it looks really organized. So when someone scans your resume, the format is the first thing that they see. It's the visual piece of it. And so it's really important for them to see your resume organized so that they can infer that you're a person that's also organized. So all these things are being mindful about how to articulate all your general skills that you have. Try to fit it in one page if you can. Fit it with as many jargons. Jargons are extremely important. That's how applicant tracking systems can pick up your content. And my colleague Kara is about to talk about LinkedIn, and she'll talk a little bit about how employers use jargon um, um, in, or, in, 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 in order to source candidates through LinkedIn. So turn it over to Kara. Thank you, Marian. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a phenomenal tool that you all have at your disposal, and it's really important that you feel comfortable with it and that you're able to use it um, in your career development process. So if you could just throw into the chat box for me, um, just curious how you're already using LinkedIn, just like a line or so, what, how you use that tool. Networking, let's see, connecting with peers, jobs, looking for jobs job searching, great. Great, a lot of jobs. So LinkedIn is a really great tool for looking for jobs. That's definitely one of the aspects of it that you can use it for, but there's so much more that you can do with it previous to looking for jobs that I definitely encourage you all to explore the site um, and use it in that capacity. So really when, you know, back in the day, it used to be about who you knew, right? You had to know someone in your network to be connected to them, to have a conversation with them. And now, um, LinkedIn brings that kind of access to everyone. So there's millions and millions of professionals on LinkedIn at your disposal, people that you can find and have conversations with to build your personal network. Um, the stat on here says 94% of recruiters and companies use LinkedIn for recruiting. So that's a huge number. There's a lot of recruiters and people on there that are looking for candidates. But not only that, this is a really useful tool for you to use in figuring out what you want to do, um, you know, maybe finding professionals that could help guide you toward, towards the proper training or the right internships to build your career. So it's not just recruiters looking to place people in jobs. Next slide. So this is what the LinkedIn profile looks like at a minimum. Um, this checklist we're going to be emailing to you after the presentation. It's really helpful when you're developing your own profiles. So your profile development is the first step of LinkedIn. That's going to be the most important because you don't want to go out there and network with people um, until you have a solid profile. So you have something solid to share with them. Um, so I'm going to go over a bunch of these sections in greater detail. Um, but just to give you an overview of some of the main sections that you see here, these are the ones that you want to make sure that you fill out. Next slide. So this is just a continuation of that checklist and some of the slides just to show you, uh, sections just to show you what LinkedIn looks like if there are some of you out there that don't yet have um, a profile. So I love this statistic. Um, LinkedIn works in this manner where a complete profile makes you more searchable. So a complete profile makes you become 40 times more likely to receive opportunities through LinkedIn and be found by others. So that's a huge difference. LinkedIn will show you your percent complete as you put together your profile. And you wanna make sure that you have that as complete as possible. LinkedIn works based on algorithms. Everything on there's algorithms, just like uh, my colleague Marian was just saying. So the more keywords you have in there, the more 
content you have in there, the more you're going to come up higher on search results and be found. So just to go over a couple of the most important sections to make sure you have those ready. Um, the top section, um, which is what people see before they scroll into your profile and learn more about you will include your, your photo, um, your URL, and then just some like uh, contact information. So you want to make sure you have a professional photo up there. You really don't need to get a professional photo taken. It's really completely fine to go in front of a white wall, put on business attire, and have somebody take your photo for you from an iPhone or a smartphone, and then just upload that to your LinkedIn profile. You want to make sure that the way you dress in your photo speaks to the part that you're looking to, to interview or to work in. So, um, you know, if you're looking to work for a corporate um, bank or financial institution, you're going to be a little bit more formal in your photo. Whereas maybe if you're looking to do, um, you know, some sort of um, tech, work for some sort of tech startup company, you want to make sure that you show them that you understand their culture, their company culture, and, and maybe they aren't wearing suits and ties. So you're not going to wear a suit and tie in your picture. You're going to want to make sure that you align with that um, industry while also looking professional. Um, the other thing is when you create a LinkedIn profile, it gives you a custom URL. So that URL is a series of letters and numbers, and it's not something that's easy to remember. You want to make sure you go into your profile and you customize that URL to be something along the lines of your first name, your last name, you know, maybe some numbers if, if it's taken. Um, but what that does for you is it makes you able to then share that URL with professionals. So you might be at a networking event or um, you might meet somebody that you didn't expect at the supermarket, at the gym, and you're able to say, oh, why don't you check out my LinkedIn URL? Here it is. And it's something you can easily share. Um, you'll also put your location, your industry, and your contact information up there on your top section um, to make sure those are complete. Okay, so next is the headline. So along with your photo and your name, your headline is the first thing that people see before they even click into your profile. The headline is incredibly important. Um, I like to think of it as the slogan for your professional brand. It's what makes somebody want to click into your profile to learn more about you. What happens is the, the headline actually defaults to student at XYZ College or um, whatever your current job title is. And so that makes it not enticing for somebody to click into, right? So, you know, a number of you are at various CUNY schools and then it will just default to that school, but then it's all the same for all of you. So it, how do you kind of set yourself apart with your profile to make someone want to click into it and learn more? Um, so it's, it's definitely suggested to customize that headline. It's hard to write. I meet with students all the time and we spend a whole, you know, 45 minutes thinking about the headline and it's not, it's 60 characters max. I think it's really not many um, or 120 max. It's, it's you know, like Twitter. Um, and so you really want to think about how you want to convey the message that you want to share with the world. What sets you apart? What you know, makes you unique or different in your professional experience. The micro-credential is certainly something that can be incorporated into here, right? This is something that maybe someone sees and they want to hear more about, um, or so, some of the tech skills that you may have, um, you know, some of the soft skills you believe you're proficient in. So you really want to think about who you are and kind of how you describe yourself and where you're headed. You also want it to make sense for the industry so that, you know, someone within your industry wants to click more to, they, they see that you're aligned. Next slide. So then once somebody clicks into your profile, um, one of the top sections is the summary. This is a tricky section because it's the most characters. It can go up to 2,000 characters. And so you have an opportunity to share a lot of information. Um, the, I kind of think of the summary as almost like a cover letter, right? So this is the intro that someone reads about you to get a little better sense of who you are. Um, keywords are very critical here. So um, this is where you're gonna wanna incorporate some of those keywords of some of the um, different fields that you're all considering going into. So, you know, if you're in, into data analytics, what are some of those key terms that are, um, you know, correspond with that. You want to make sure those are there. That's how you become searchable. A recruiter goes on there and they look for a certain skill, they'll search it. And the more times that's in your profile, then it'll help you come up higher in a result. Um, a, a 
a nice kind of format that I like to think of for the summary that I often share is a three paragraph format um, in drafting the summary. If it's just one giant paragraph of text, it becomes cumbersome for somebody to read. They'll look at it and skip over it. Three paragraphs breaks it up nicely for the eye. And what I like to do is make your first paragraph an intro about yourself, sharing a little bit of information about who you are, what you're majoring in, what your career goals are, um, you know, what maybe some of your previous internships have been. And then that second paragraph becomes a bulleted one. So bullets are great because someone who doesn't want to read a lot of text can just skip right to those bullets and get um, a quick overview about you. Um, and so you want to put in those bullets maybe some of your key accomplishments, some of the successes that you've had, anything that has a data metric, like a, you know, you, you did something that led to uh, a reduction in time or um, an increase in, you know, efficiency or raised a certain amount of money. Those are really the best bullets to put. Also, if you maybe maintained a certain GPA while working a certain amount of hours um, or held a leadership position, these are great accomplishments to include in that section. And then the third paragraph can really be a number of things. One thought that I often uh, share with students is maybe like share your philosophy around your field, right? You guys are students, you're learning so much every day. You're at the top of, you know, hearing about what's going on in your field. Maybe share what your philosophy is, what you what you see as the, you know, the future of, of some of these kind of technology fields that you're learning so much about. Um, sometimes people also put like um, keywords in this third paragraph or core competencies. There's lots of different ways you can go with it. I definitely suggest you look at profiles of other people to give, get your, an idea for yourself. Next slide. Okay, so then the education and experience section. This can be very similar to the resume. I definitely um, suggest you take a lot of the advice that Marian just shared about resumes and just incorporate that into these sections for um, the LinkedIn profile as well. You can copy and paste over um, to have that there, um, but you definitely want to maintain that, you know, sharing accomplishments and um, the technical jargon and those keywords all throughout these sections as well. Okay, so this is a sample uh, LinkedIn profile that I just found online. Um, she's uh, in data analysis. You can see here that she took the time to customize her um, headline, um, make it something interesting. When you see that, you might want to click on that. See, I'd love to learn more about what this person has done. Um, that about section, that's that summary that we just talked about. With three paragraphs, she has a bulleted middle section um, like we just described, um, and then her experience in education. Um, if you could all just throw into the chat box, where do you think that she could incorporate the micro credential in here? What are some thoughts? Any ideas? Accomplishments, certificates, accomplishments, education. So certainly within education, skills and endorsements, these are certainly sections that they can, she can include a micro-credential. Um, so there is a certification section. I don't think it's up on here. Um, the micro-credential can be woven into the headline. It can definitely be mentioned in the summary section. Um, depending on what your experiences have been, it can go in the experience section. So experience doesn't necessarily have to be a paid job. An experience can be <coughs> a job, an internship, a volunteer opportunity. It can be this micro-credential program. As long as you convey it um, honestly what it is and you're not calling it a job or you're not giving yourself a title that's not accurate, you can, you can really weave those things into anywhere. If you have lots of work experiences or internship experiences already, that probably isn't the best place for it. Um, but if you don't, and this is one of your own few experiences you've had, you can put it there. Um, like if you've done any, you know, hackathons or any of those, um, those um, kind of, you know, extracurricular programs, you could put those as an experience as well. It really, oh, I see that question just came in. It really depends. Every LinkedIn is going to be different. There's not one way to do it. Um, it, you know, it really depends on your experience. So what shows you in the best light possible? You also want to think about 
the most important things need to come first because somebody's not going to read on and on and on in your LinkedIn profile. If something that's really critical about you comes all the way at the bottom, you have to think of a way that you can get it closer to the top. So it's really going to vary. I would suggest meeting with someone in your career services department um, to talk about how to structure your specific LinkedIn profile. Okay, so these are some of the other sections that you can include on LinkedIn. Um, so certification certainly is somewhere that the micro credential should go, um, among others. And then these are some of the other sections that you can include, um, depending on what you have. Next slide. Okay, so now we have our profile set. So now we want to use our LinkedIn for networking. This is um, really what LinkedIn is all about. Um, so the way LinkedIn works, if you're not familiar, is it's this degrees of separation. So it's kind of like uh, other you know, forms of social media where you have connections. So anyone that you're connected to becomes your first degree connection. And then anyone that they're connected to becomes your second degree. And anyone that they're connected to becomes your third degree. <coughs> so LinkedIn helps open opportunities for you because your connections, connections, connections become people that you can network with. So you can have like 300 connections, but that can actually connect you indirectly to millions of people through the second and third degree. The other way you can use LinkedIn is to join groups, and then you could connect with professionals through groups of um, common interest areas or around certain topics. So once you have your connections, and I definitely suggest a minimum of 50 to really um, have the site be useful for you, <coughs> um, you want to find people to connect with. So you can look for people within your groups. You can look for connections of friends and colleagues. You can look at um, fellow college alumni, or you can look at people that you know work at a company that you're interested in. You just search that company. The second step to that would be to re reach out to them and request an informational interview. Um, you would want to prepare some questions to ask them, and then you would want to have a conversation with them to learn about what they do and how they got to be where they're at and, um, you know, how they can be useful to you. Um, you also want to maintain the, the relationship. So LinkedIn really is about quality over quantity. The goal is not to have millions and millions of connections like other forms of social media. The goal is to build some valuable relationships. And I definitely suggest doing this now when you're not necessarily looking for a job, because then when you are looking for a job, you have people that you can reach out to that have been, you know, helpful for you. Really, all you need is a handful of people that, you know, can be mentors to you or um, really are, you know, interested in looking out for you um, in, as you go through this process. Next. So this is the alumni portal. I mentioned you can use your alumni network to find people. I definitely suggest checking your alumni portal. This is a really great place to find people to network with. Um, really mostly because when you have when you have that shared school connection, people tend to be more willing to chat with you because they feel a connection to you off the bat. And lastly, this is a sample request letter that you can send when outreaching to somebody to engage in networking. Um, so you're not you know, asking for a job. You're not even saying, can I share my resume? You're simply just asking to have a conversation um, to get some advice or to learn from them. People tend to like to talk about themselves and share their experiences. And so um, that's the best way to approach it. Thank you very much. I'm gonna um, turn it over to Marietta now. Oh, Marietta, I think you have to come off mute. Marietta, I think Mary. you need to come off mute. It's not, it's not working all the time. Thank you for the presentation, Kara. I always enjoy hearing it. I um, always learn something else. Uh, so we're gonna talk about preparing for a personal pitch. Uh, and I just wanna prelude that with a, um, urban legend, I don't know if it's true, it's been around for oh, maybe 20 plus years that um, a young professional got into an elevator and he was going to the 42nd floor, which took quite some time to get there, standing next to someone and that someone asked him, well, where are you going? And he tells him where he's going. And he said, what do you do? And he gave him a story of who he was and his education and what his goal, career goals were and how he was hoping to get a certain position. And when the, the, they arrived on the floor, the appropriate floor, the man turned around and gave him his business card and he says, when you're ready, give me a call. 
it turns out that the man that gave him the card was the CEO of Coca-Cola. I'm not sure that it's true, but it certainly sounds good. But I can tell you from experience that it happens all the time. It's happened to me. It has happened to my colleagues all over Wall Street. So yes, you never know who you're talking to. And that's why it's also important that you really have a solid personal pitch that is not too long, doesn't say too much, clear, concise to the point, sends a message that I'm unique, I'm someone you would want to talk to and, and work with, and I will make your life better, and I will contribute to, to the best of my ability. Um, so the personal pitch is a story about your, fun, it's a fundamental communication tool, it's a story about you. You have to develop it, it's, again, going back to self-reflection, you have to think about what am I, um, you know, assets and how am I going to present myself? And it goes back to how you're retired and where you are, um, you know, gearing yourself towards. And you introduce yourself by name and your uh, pitch will be used not just in an interview, but you'll use it when you're doing networking, you're attending uh, events, you may be at a cocktail party and someone says, tell me about yourself because you never know who you're talking to. So that pitch is something that you should hone, keep clean, update, and make sure it's clear, concise to the point and tells the story about you. So it's a really good tool. Um, if you're starting out, here's a good way to identify yourself. I'm a rising junior, very interested in cybersecurity. You don't know those people, but now they know that you're a junior, you go to college and you're interested in cybersecurity. So you must be taking some very serious uh, courses. And that's how the message begins. Um, can we have the next? Oh, thank you. Um, so you're going to challenge yourself. I think the slides are moving too fast. Can we go back to guidelines? Thank you. Um, so you tr challenge yourself to think about, to think about the things that you've done. Um, make sure your story is down to two minutes because if you, you start talking three minutes, four minutes, you're windmilling. You're just, your mind is telling you you're doing a great job talking and you're not stopping and you have lost your audience. So it's very important that you have that structure around it and then you have the general category of who you are, identify yourself. So you could say, I'm a native of Dallas, Texas, and I moved to New York to attend college. Create a visual personal image associating yourself with your identity. One of the big ones that college students can use very, very appropriately is if they are self-funding their education, that is something that should be in your story. It's important. Employers, future employers, potential employers want to know that. It's very impressive. The other thing that's very impressive to them is if you're a sports, a student sports athlete, that means that you are acquiring a lot of organizational skills, time management, your team worker, your leadership skills are there. So this is all just telling them one thing tells them a lot of things about you. So put those things in and Let's just, I want to just go through what some of them are and make sure that you're memorable and unique. So if you grew up on a farm, that's something that you want to mention. Um, if you emigrated to the U.S. with your family and you, and you speak other languages, you want to tell them that. Um, so one of the ones that is pretty successful is growing up. I was unsure about what I wanted to do, but I knew I was mathematically inclined. When I entered high school, I discovered a passion for technology, which requires solid math skills. So now you're taking math, mathematics and your inclination towards math and math skills. Now I'm pursuing that passion and taking myself to expanded courses and to deepen my knowledge of whatever it is that you are uh, studying and preparing for, whether it's cybersecurity or any of the other micro credentials. So you, another one that you could use is in high school, my sister and I love to make designs. We began making handmade cards, branded them and sold them to local stationers. That evolved into my passion for graphic arts. So it tells them a lot. It says you're innovative. You have a burning desire to do something. You managed to build a business even though you're going to school and you're doing great in school. Um, 
Growing is another one. Growing up as a child, I was always organized and meticulous with my toys and schoolwork. This aptitude makes me a good candidate for a career in project management. You told me a lot just in that one sentence. So think about the things that um, you love, that give you passion about the project or the matter, and that you can weave into your two minute story. So if you're in, the students I deal with are largely in finance. And so we always talk about what fires your passion for finance. So here are some on, on the screen, which is I could be involved in the development of many companies without starting a company myself. So remember that you must always say what sparked your interest and then you have to be able to back up your story. Um, the other piece is that, and students have done this. So some of you may have volunteered. Some of you may have been camp counselors and uh, managed uh, younger children. Those are all also very important things to bring up. Uh, one that came to me a few years ago was someone who said they volunteered with, a special need, with special needs children and that exposed them to a very new and different interacting system with individuals and discovered that the meaning of his actions as a stakeholder and a creator of resources impacted on these children. And um, he finally decided that software engineering was what he wanted to do. And because he knew that if he could design new applications within the software needs of the end users in mind, meaning the individuals with special needs, he was gonna not only, he was taking his entire career and his passion full degrees to 360 coming through the loop. So um, expertise, the things that you wanna express if you go back at your SWOT analysis, some of those things should be there, focusing on competencies and skills that you've acquired through your internship, club memberships, could be even through religious organizations, societies. But are you a self-starter, able to work in a dynamic environment? Are you detail-oriented? Are you an independent thinker? Able to synthesize large amounts of data without losing sight of the big picture? Um, are you focused, resilient, organized? These are all skills. Think about what you're really good at. Self-reflection, accuracy and attention to detail and the ability to or, uh, prioritize and manage multiple projects makes you a good manager. And employers are always looking for individuals that they can develop into managers. So, um, your unique strengths are yours, um, something that you can talk about whatever it is that you feel is appropriate and articulate those qualities that differentiate you from others that may be also looking for the same opportunity. But make yourself exceptional in one way. Are you a student athlete? Are you someone who writes for the school newspaper? Are you, have you been a reporter? Have you been a volunteer fireman? Um, have, you, have you overcome immigration to the US and learned English? Those are very valuable skills. Um, something, it, can, it does not have to be serious. You can say something funny. Sometimes something funny will attract uh, attention of the interviewer or the person you're networking with and they find you endearing. And anything else you say after that can't be bad. Um, you know, if you took AP classes, that's very important. You wanna really um, do that if you've done it express it, that it's how you've advanced your education uh, and applying analytical skills to show your desire to excel, uh, taking a foreign language. So all of these things are you unique and their strengths that you've worked on and developed and acquired. And somehow you have to bring them all into the loop. Um, so last slide is Identify what prompts you to be interested. Don't forget that because that is the core of what you're trying to accomplish. Whatever the industry is or whatever that job is about, the burning desire to do well. Um, don't ask for the job. Tell them what you have and what is the best fit for them that you have to offer for the job. Never ask for the job. Don't say, I'm here for this job. That's clear and obvious. Um, 
And you really want to talk about what attributes your desire to be in a specific area and your goal of contributing to that community of individuals and the overall growth of, in your cases, the global te technology community. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you put them in the chat box. Thank you. Our next presentation is very important. Interview, is it networking or interviewing? Networking. Oh, networking, okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Marietta. Uh, developing a personal pitch is very, very important and it's a piece of networking. And so we're gonna start off right now with a little video. It's just a one and a half minute clip of a Princeton grad by the name of Isaac Kawanji. Uh, who has this to say about networking and the importance of networking. It's coming up right now. He talks about a book called Never Eat Alone, which if you're looking for a great book to read, that's a great book to read. And here we go. June 4th, 2013. It was graduation for me, and it was mixed emotions. On one side, I was elated to graduate from the number one academic institution in the country. I was excited. On the other end, and we have some college graduates here, to graduate unemployed kind of hurts your gut a little bit. <laughs> but it raised some questions. And I can remember one of my good friends giving me a book. And the book changed my perspective. The book was Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. It talked about his journey, his professional journey, as he used networking and building relationships to not only grow professionally, but personally. So I thought to myself, if it could work for him, maybe I should try it. So the next six months I did. And the results were amazing. Instead of looking for jobs, Instead of reaching out, jobs were coming to me. JP Morgan, NCAA, Princeton University. I was amazed, I was excited for myself, but more so, it raised the question in my mind. How was I getting these results? And number two, why aren't our academic institutions, why aren't our colleges and our high schools teaching young people this very important skill set? And that is exactly what we're going to do today, which is we are going to teach you this very important skill set. Marietta talked a lot about the personal pitch, which is a one way. It's a one way conversation talking about yourself, but networking is very much of a two way conversation. It's literally having a conversation, asking about the other person, learning about that person. If we think about what is networking, networking is building relationships with people. Just like we network with friends, we also network with business professionals. It's making connections with people who we have shared interests with. Maybe they're alumni, maybe they're, maybe they're also in the data analytic world, maybe they're in the sports world that we like. It's helping each other grow professionally and, and personally connecting each other with opportunities when we have friends and we know that they're looking for something, we connect friends. The same thing is true with our business network. We connect each other with some with maybe some interest that we have or an opportunity that we see and we give advice. Next. So why is networking so important? Well, it's exactly what Isaac Kawanji in that, in that video was saying, because it brings opportunity to us without actually going around and saying, will you hire me, will you hire me? So upwards of 85% of open positions are filled through networking, which means Okay, that says here at least 70% of jobs are not even listed. They're not even listed on a job board. Um, you can go to monster.com or indeed.com. You won't find many, many, many jobs listed there. Why? Because they're found through word of mouth. And that's why networking is so important is because through word of mouth, you will learn about an opportunity, an internship, something that fits you just by talking to your business network. And that's the whole idea of networking. Next. So as I, as I talked about this is that we network with friends, something you already know how to do. If you have more than one friend, you already know how to make a friend. And the idea to make a friend is to enrich your social life, right? Is to enrich yourself personally. 
We do the same thing with business professionals. We want to enrich our business network. We want to enrich our career life. Next. Here, it's the same thing. We want to grow our circle of friends and create a satisfying social life and grow our circle of business connections and create a satisfying career life. They are parallel networks. Next. So who exactly, who are the professionals that we want to network with? Who are we trying to seek out and look for? Well, right here on campus, it's, it's your professors. You wanna, also you wanna network with college alumni who share your interests. You can either be networking with juniors and seniors above you, or we're gonna learn how you can go onto LinkedIn and you can go into your BMCC alumni portal or your Queensborough uh, Community College alumni portal. Recruiters at job and career fairs, you wanna make sure you go to your career fairs and your job fairs, and you wanna speak with those recruiters. That is networking. You wanna give them your pitch and then ask them what's going on in their industry? What's going on in their company? What changes are happening? Asking questions. Professionals who speak at corporate events on college campuses are excellent professors to network with, professionals to network with. Okay, there's many, many panelists that come and go all the time in your, uh, on your campuses. Make sure you're aware of them, go to them. Even if you're not sure you're interested in that particular industry, go, you never know who you may meet and who you may speak with. Speak with your school club leaders and members any kind of coaches at all, sports, drama, career, educational coaches that know more than you know about your industry is someone that you wanna connect with. As Marietta was saying, sometimes we don't even know who we're talking to. Maintaining a personal, a professional air about you and when whoever you're speaking to, tell, tell a little bit about yourself, but most importantly, ask questions about that person. You could be at a party, at a sport event, or at a family gathering and meet someone who can really help you with your career. Of course, there's employers and professionals that you meet at networking events. Next slide. So again, where do we meet these? We meet them on campus as well as other places. I wanna talk about meetup.com. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Meetup. Everybody always talks about LinkedIn, but meetup.com is a fabulous place to learn to network. Uh, it, you'll have to make a, um, go onto meetup.com. You'll have to make an account, it's free. There's all kinds of meetups. People are meeting up to go biking and hiking, but there's so many professional events to, net, to, uh, to meet up with people. And right now, of course, meeting up is online. But prior to this and after COVID's over, it'll be face to face. Um, so I'm wondering right now, how do you feel about your networking on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is I, I feel very uncomfortable networking to 10 is I'm an expert networker and five is ah, not so good. Where are you with your networking? How do you feel about yourself? I see a 10, nine, six, four, one, eight, yeah. It, we're all over the board. It's a process. It's a learning process. And the only way you learn how to network is to practice. And in my opinion, the best way to practice is practice first with people that you feel comfortable with. Practice with recruiters that come on to your career fairs. Go on to meetup.com. Go to some of these events. These are places to practice. You're in a screen. You're in a Zoom room. Nobody knows who you are. You can ask a few questions. Next slide. Okay, so back to LinkedIn. Here's something else. If you know that you're going to be networking, let's just say that you know you're going to a career fair and you know the name of the recruiter who you want to speak to because you're interested in that particular that particular uh, organization or business. You want to make sure you go onto LinkedIn first and find out a little bit about that recruiter. LinkedIn is not just a way to network with other people, but it's a way to find out what to get some information about the people that you're going to be meeting. So that when you meet with them, you already know they like soccer or they're into data analytics, or maybe that they came here from another country is just the way you did, or maybe they're a chess player, something that will help you connect. So LinkedIn is a very good research tool to help you research about people that you want to connect with. Now, how to connect with. The first thing you wanna do when you go into linkedin.com after you do your profile is you wanna join your college alumni group. Whatever college you're from, there's an alumni portal. Why? Because alumni are happy to help out their fellow students. And, and if you think about that, five years out from now, when a student reaches out to you from your alumni, are you going to be willing to help them? Chances are you will be. 
People want to help other people, particularly someone that they have a connection with. You can join professional groups. You can Google up right now and Google up data analytics, analytics networking group. Just Google it. And you will come up with networking groups about data analytics in New York City. Or right now it's on Zoom and it's anywhere. And you can just join those groups and join those groups on LinkedIn. You can actually just, you don't even have to Google. On LinkedIn, there's a, there's a search. You can just search under groups, data analytic groups, um, code smithing groups, and it'll come right up. Next, next slide. Okay, so how to network. Do we say, will you be my friend? No, that's what we did when we were little. Do you say, would you like to join my study group? Let's grab a coffee. Do you need help? That's exactly what we do when that's how we make friends. It's exactly what we do when we're networking with professionals. Next slide. Next slide. So when you're talking to a professional, as Marietta said, said, uh, you know, you don't want to say, will you hire me? You don't want to say, will you find me an internship? You also don't want to talk nonstop about yourself. Yes, you want to give your personal pitch, but you want to make sure that it's a two-way conversation. So what do you want to do? You want to introduce, introduce yourself quickly. You want to ask questions about the person. You want to ask advice. You want to be energetic and positive. You want to be professional. You want to be, it's important to be interested in other people. People like talk about themselves. So ask people, if you don't know what to ask, ask them, how did you get into this business? What do you like about it? What other you know, what other companies would you suggest are worth looking into? What's, what's changing in the industry? Next slide. Okay, and where is this is all happening? On the phone, via Zoom, over a cup of coffee, during a career fair? I think you get the idea. Next slide. Now we're gonna practice. We are putting you into breakout rooms, but these are not the breakout rooms for your micro credentials. That will happen a little bit later. These are breakout rooms of two or three people where you're gonna have an opportunity to quickly give a personal pitch or quickly introduce yourself and then ask someone else in the room about themselves. Let's have a little bit of a networking session. We're gonna put you into groups right now and please join the breakout rooms. Any student in the room, if you don't see a notification, please let me know. Feel free to mute yourself at this point. Not this. All right. Whether or not this uh, firm is your first choice uh, in the interviewer's eyes, it is. Uh, and so you, because there are three things that the interviewer is going to be evaluating you on. One is, do you fit with the position? Do you have the skills and experience necessary to uh, excel in the role? The second thing is, do you fit within the organization? And not just the organization as a whole, but also the departmental culture. And the third thing is they're evaluating you on is how badly do you want it? And your level of preparedness is directly tied to you proving to the interviewers that you want it. Uh, because you're going to show them that you took the time to do the research that is necessary to tie who you are to who they are, okay? So um, that's how you convince them that they're fortunate because you fit with what it is that they're looking for. And then ultimately, your ultimate goal is to get an offer from, from the organization. So in terms of dress, um, you know, I, I did meet with a student a couple weeks ago for a practice or a mock interview via Zoom and she was having an interview coming up and it was in person. I would say that's in these days, that's probably not the norm. Uh, these days you will be interviewing via some sort of video platform, but you still need to dress completely uh, because if you have to stand up for whatever reason, you don't want to have your PJs on the bottom and then your suit on the top. So this is a visual to give you an idea of what's the difference between professional attire and business casual attire. When in doubt, dress in business professional attire for an interview. You want to be the best looking person dressed wise in the room or in the Zoom room as it were. Uh, and so what do you do? So if you have long hair, male, female, what have you, long hair, pull it back. 
just you don't want them looking at your hair. You don't want them looking at flyaways. You want them looking at you and hearing what you're, you're telling them about your achievements and how you fit within the organization. So pull your hair back. Wear neutral colors. Uh, so that would be black, gray, different shades of gray, you know, um, charcoal, anything that's just very neutral. Um, for, um, for those who identify as male, you're going to wear a tie. Make sure your tie is nice and neat. And of course, male or female, when you're wearing a, 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 a dress shirt, make sure it's pressed, your collars are down, they're not sticking up and flying away, okay? So that's all I'll say about that for now. Okay, so your focus is to tie your previous experiences uh, to what it is that the organization is looking for. And so it's extremely important for you to have a sense of the job requirements and responsibilities. And in advance, what you need to do is take a look at what are the key responsibilities and requirements that you see keep on there being repeated throughout the description. Those, those requirements that are mentioned more than you know, two times or more, you can probably safely guess that those are the, those are the skills that you're really going to uh, need to have. And so what you wanna do is think about your past experiences and what are the direct skills or transferable skills that you have that match with those requirements? Many times students, you know, especially if you're just starting out in college, you may not have a lot of like what quote unquote professional experience. All experience is valid. So retail jobs, volunteer positions, part-time opportunities at, you know, in a restaurant as a server, um, clubs and organizational activities, on-campus jobs, school projects and papers, presentations, those are all valid experiences that you can tell stories about to convince the interviewer that you can do the, you can do the work. So this last one, the portfolio of your past work, uh, you know, for those of you who let's say are involved in like um, some sort of technical role where maybe you're creating visual things to, to you know, to show uh, an interviewer, you can have a, a sort of a handheld portfolio. My recommendation going back to LinkedIn is to upload any sort of projects that you have onto your LinkedIn profile. Your LinkedIn, your LinkedIn profile is really your online portfolio. And you could, you could upload links, multimedia documents, make it really sort of jazzy uh, and enable the interviewer, you can say, oh, you know what, just go into my LinkedIn profile, you can find my examples of my work there. Okay, so you do your research on everything. Um, so you're prepared, you should be doing your research in advance, even as you apply for an opportunity, right? Like, why are you applying for this position? If you know nothing about it, there should be some impetus for you to be clicking that submit button. So research all these four different areas. And I've listed here some resources for you to do that research. Of course, LinkedIn is there. I mean, I think you're getting the hint that LinkedIn is a really valuable resource for you and your professional development. And as you, you know, every, every interview you go on, the way your delivery, what you're saying about yourself, your pitch, your conversation, that is all geared towards who that organization is, what industry do they sit in, and what role are you interviewing for? So it needs to be very targeted. So in terms of the types of questioning you're going to get, you're going to primarily get behavior-based interview questions. These are open-ended questions. Uh, it's based on the premise that the best predictor of future behavior is your past behavior. And in order for you to convince an interviewer that you can do the work, you need to tell stories. You need to hop into your time machine with your interviewer, go back in time, hover outside an experience, and allow that interviewer to see in their mind what you experienced. So the, the thing here is you don't want to generate, you don't want, if you get a question, tell me about a time where you dealt with a difficult customer or client, you don't want to give your theory of customer service. That's not what they're asking. They're asking you to walk them through a specific point in time where you had to deal with a difficult or demanding customer and what did you specifically do? So you need to tell a story from one point in time. This is, the, this is the response technique that you follow to an open-ended behavior-based interview. You describe the situation you faced in that one point in time. You talk about the task at hand that you're faced with based on that situation. You talk about the actions that you took, the steps you took in order to remedy that situation. And what was the end result? You know, what happened? And they lived happily ever after. What happened in that situation based on your actions, your actions? And these are, some, these are some example questions and you'll see, you can't say yes or no to these, okay? So when you get a question that you, where you can't say yes or no, assume that you need to use that STAR format, situation, task, action, result. Uh, virtual interviewing, I know we're almost out of time. That's, this is how we're doing things these days, right? We're here, all here sitting in our, wherever we are doing a, a virtual workshop. 
So you do need to make sure that your technology is up to date. So update the latest version, that your, your, all of your technology is full of batteries, uh, that you set the scene, you know, so lighting is okay. You're, you're sort of in the center of your space for, for the interview, um, that you're, you're being viewed from sort of the chest up. Uh, and you also need to make sure that you're informing others who you live with, whether it's a human or, a, or an animal, a pet, uh, you need to figure out a way in which to not get disturbed by people who share the same space as you. Uh, so that means telling individuals that you have something very important coming up and to not be disturbed. Okay, at the end of the interview, you always need to have questions. If you don't, if the interviewer says to you, so what kind of questions do you have for us? And you say, no, I think I'm good, covered it all. That is like not, that's a really bad thing. <laughs> You always want to have questions, write them out in advance so you don't forget, ask at least three questions. Um, and then after those three or four basic, like specific questions, you also then want to say, when can I expect to hear from you? Make note of that. And if it's a week from now and you don't hear from the interviewer a week from now, you want to make sure you follow up with them and ask them what your status is and reinforce your interest in the opportunity. Uh, and then of course, within 24 to 36, maybe 48 hours if it's over a weekend, but usually 24 to 36 hours, send a thank you letter. Um, sometimes a decision is made as to the candidate whether or not you sent a thank you letter. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jen. And thank you to all of our presenters and all of our viewers for joining us. As we wrap up and before I go through the checklist to success, which is the next slide, um, I'd love for the, our viewers to provide us with one takeaway before going off into your micro-credential breakout with the faculty. And if you could do that in the chat. It would be great. So Jen, can we go to the next slide? Tina, there's no checklist for success on this. Oh, okay, so then so right. then we are going to, uh, I, will, I will review the checklist for success. So attend virtual workshops and events, both on campus and off campus. They provide great networking opportunities. Attend career fairs. They provide great job and internship opportunities. Create your LinkedIn profile. Draft a resume. Have it reviewed by a career counselor. Practice your interviewing skills. Complete career assessments and conduct informational interviews. Remember, CEOs are looking to hire you. Use your resources. Ask questions. Get clarification. Be confident in your skills, your knowledge and abilities, and keep up the great work. Remember, you got this. So now everyone's going to be placed in their breakout, in their micro-credentialing breakout with a faculty member. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Good Thank luck. You. Should we stop recording?